cannot see your face, but only faith can see the Lord of majesty. Your presence is true, and grace makes us sure that tasting your love, we hunger for more. Not as mere bread, not as mere wine, but as you truly are. Body and blood, in thanksgiving we bow, humbled by your gift of Eucharistic love, the presence of our God. On that holy night, when you lay down your life, you left us a died for our sins and was risen again. And we wait for the day when all is made new. In your house we'll remain forever with you. Not as mere bread, not as mere wine, as you truly are. Body and welcome for our online service here on Palm Sunday. As I shared with you last week, something we always do on Palm Sunday is celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. So if you're already prepared, I uh, commend you on your memory. And if you are not prepared, you can easily pause us at any point in the service and go and prepare your juice and your bread for the Sacrament of Holy Communion. Now, as you notice, we're back again filming in our house. We spent a lot of time this week trying to rectify the problem out at the church. We were there for about two hours on Thursday, another hour and a half on Wednesday night, and for a few more hours on Monday afternoon, and we still weren't able to get the problem resolved. So, just we are working on it. I thank you for your patience and understanding on this as we're trying our best to, you know, solve the problems and get back to providing you the worship inside the church, but we'll still be having the hymns in the church and at least you get to see that experience. So I hope that if you want to, that you join us for our services on, on Good Friday and Easter Sunday as well. So our Good Friday service will be at our normal time at 10 a.m. and our Easter Sunday. And if you can't join us in house, then you will be able to experience it online as well. These are very special services. And just pray that during this Holy Week that you will be touched and inspired and blessed once again by the wonderful services that we experience at this time of year. It's one of the highlights of our Christian faith, isn't it? And I just pray over this Easter season that you will be touched and blessed by our services. So let's prepare our hearts, shall we? As we begin our worship with a moment of prayer, let us pray. Heavenly Father, here we are on Palm Sunday. And just as the crowds gathered that first Palm Sunday, we are gathered this day to offer you the worship that you deserve. As they sing, we sing. As they wave branches, we wave our hands in glory, 
saying you are our God and thank you for coming as our Messiah. So today, God, we just ask that you speak into our hearts so that we can be filled with the same joy that the crowd did on that Palm Sunday. We offer this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. So let us continue our service now with Welcome to This House, followed by Holy, 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 and our opening hymn on this Palm Sunday. Thank you. 
Heavenly Father, it is with such joy and thanksgiving that we have journeyed through another Lent, and here we are knocking on the door of Holy Week. And as we knock on that door, we realize the best way we can have our hearts open to the true experience of Easter is to enter into holy worship. And that is the gift that you are giving us at this time. And what a gift it is to be able to be with you, to worship you, to enjoy you, to honor you, and to be fed by you spiritually and emotionally. Because we know, God, this is a very hard and difficult world in which we live. And these are very hard times, seeing the war that we are in Ukraine, seeing the uncertainty that we are in our world, living through the pandemic that we have, and so on and so on. It's been a challenge, but faith has sustained us. And we thank you for that. But we know, God, we should have a faith that is always obedient always faithful to you, and that isn't always our faith. Sometimes our faith is strong, and other times weak. Sometimes our faith is obedient, and other times disobedient. So for the times our faith has not been obedient, we come to you at this time and lay each of our sins and our transgressions before you, because we know, God, that the reason Jesus had to die on the cross was for our sins. So once again, we confess our sins, lay them before the cross and ask for your holy forgiveness. Bestow it upon us, God. Bless us with it so that we can live forgiven lives, not just through this holy week, but each and every day. But may we also realize that as forgiven children, may we offer forgiveness, may we offer love and grace to all that we meet. We offer this prayer in Christ's name who taught each and every one of us when to pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, for so many years, it's been our tradition to have Don Pritchard with us on Palm Sunday to sing for us the special music of this time of year. Let us enjoy once again.
special music associated with Palm Sunday. And we know something else associated with Palm Sunday is the crowds gathered and giving Jesus the worship that he deserves. And that is going to be the focus of our story and lessons for today. So for our story time, pondering time, what I want to do is think about the word palm. And one thing that really came to my mind is the palm of our hand. Now, imagine for a moment if we did not use the palm of our hand, how different so many things would be that we do each and every day. For instance, here is a glass. Now, typically, we hold it with our thumb and our fingers and it rests secure in the palm of our hand. Now imagine if we couldn't use our palm or the inside of our fingertips. Imagine if we had to drink using the outside of our hand and our palm. Can you imagine trying to drink this way and balance liquid in it? It would be a challenge. I'm sure many of us would spill all over ourselves as we try and reach and reach and reach and maybe, maybe, maybe get it in our mouth, but so many times it would fall over, wouldn't it? Now, here's something else that we use that would be a challenge if we couldn't use the palm of our hand, and that is a pencil. Again, when you write with a pencil, what do you do? You've got it in your index finger, your thumb supports, and it is inside the palm of your hand. Now, imagine for a moment if we couldn't have it in the palm of our hand, that we had to do this on the outside of our hand. So, if I taped it to the outside of my hand, imagine us having to try to write this way with a pencil. It would be pretty messy, wouldn't it? Look at how our arms would have to go around, up and down, and try to dot an I and cross a T and so on and so on. We would need even more room between desks when we were kids, would we, than what we did experience and have. So, to drink with a cup, to write with a pencil, or to say even to shake hands. It would be a different experience, wouldn't it, if we couldn't shake with the palm of our hand to try to do it with the outside. We'd be basically going like this or like this. Very different experience, wouldn't it be? So, when you think of palm, I think of the palm of my hand. And as we see, God created us in a special way, in a unique way, that we need the palm of our hand. Well, on Palm Sunday, we saw some things that God also created us to do. One is to worship Him, as we saw it take place on that Palm Sunday. Something else that God created us to do is to give back to Him, just like that owner of the colt did. He gave it back to Jesus to use on that Palm Sunday. And as we know, God also created us to follow Jesus. And that was what the crowd and the disciples were doing on that Sunday. So, as we see, just as God created our palm, on Palm Sunday we see some of the things that God created us to do. But let me ask you, are we learning and using the lessons from Palm Sunday? And what do I mean by that? Are we worshiping just like they did on Palm Sunday? Or are we not using our palms properly to worship? When it comes to giving, are we following the example of Palm Sunday or doing it differently in a way that God didn't create or desire for us? When it comes to following Him, are we following Jesus in the ways that God desires and wants for us? Or are we using different ways, coming up with our own ways to follow Him? As I showed with the example with my hands, how did God create us to use our hands and to hold certain things? By using our palm. 
And one of the things I think we should take away today is examine the stories of Palm Sunday, some of the things that they were doing, and see, are we doing the things in the way that God desires? Worshiping Him, following Him, giving to Him, or are we doing it in a different way? Just the same way as we saw, not using the palm of our hand to hold a cup, or to hold a pencil, or to try to shake a hand. It's very different. But what does God want? To live and do things in the way he created us for. That is our story time and pondering time today. Let us continue our service now with our next hymn, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. turn to our reading on this Palm Sunday, let us come before God, shall we, in our prayer for understanding. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful. We are anticipating such a great Holy Week, and what a way to start it than our Palm Sunday service. You've touched us. You've inspired us. We are getting ready to follow the crowd's example and worship and celebrate all the wonderful things that our Lord and Savior has done for us. So as we come before your word right now, we ask once again, God, that you open our hearts and our minds and our ears because that is what we need to have right now, our spiritual food food that sustains us, food that nurtures us, food that blesses us. So God, touch each one of us, encourage each one of us, inspire each one of us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, we're continuing on our series of looking at various crossroad moments. Today, we're looking at another crossroad, a crossroad that Jesus had to encounter, and that is as he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. Our story, our passage today, if you want to follow along in your Bibles, is Luke 19, verses 28 to 40. Let us hear again the words of God. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples ahead, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt there which has no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it, say, 
The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we just heard the story once again of Jesus making his entrance into Jerusalem. And as he was riding down on that colt, just passing the Mount of Olives, one thing Jesus knew in his heart, a heart of this, at this moment, there was no going back. And what do I mean by that? He knew at that moment there was no way that he could get out of facing the cross. Why? Because of so many factors. The first is when he made his entry in. During the busiest time in the religious season, the Passover festival, Millions of people were in Jerusalem at that time, celebrating the Passover. Now, if Jesus had slipped into Jerusalem at any other season, at any other time, then maybe he could have got in unnoticed, but not during this busy season, and not especially after he raised Lazarus back to life, because by this point in time, everyone had heard about that, and everyone knew about Jesus. So that's one reason there was no going back for him. He wasn't slipping in at a non-busy time or under the cloakness of night. No, he was coming in at the busiest of time. Second reason there was no going back for Jesus at this time to face the cross is because of the fact he rode in on a colt. And by doing this, he was actually fulfilling a prophecy that was made 500 years earlier through the prophet Zechariah. You can find this prophecy in Zechariah 9, 9 that says this, Rejoice, O people of Zion! Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem! Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey riding on a colt. And when Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day on the colt, all the people realized what Jesus was doing, fulfilling this prophecy concerning the Messiah, the Savior. So that is why the people were rejoicing. That is why the people were shouting. They realized that Jesus is their king and acknowledging that fact. That was the second reason that Jesus realized there was no going back when it came to making this entry. He was fulfilling a prophecy, and everyone there realized it. But there was one other reason, that there was no way for Jesus to go back on facing the cross when it came to this moment. And the other reason is this, the religious leaders were there and watching. Now, it should be no surprise to us because when you read through the Gospels, you see almost everywhere Jesus went, one of the religious leaders typically were there to kind of watch his actions, report on his behaviors, try to pick out things he was doing right or wrong. Well, the religious leaders were watching and they were upset. They weren't bothered by the fact that the crowd was shouting as they were. One of the reasons they were so upset is they knew that the crowd was thinking that Jesus was fulfilling this Old Testament prophecy. And in their mind, this was blasphemy. Because remember, the religious leaders never believed that Jesus is a king. Teacher, yes. Rabbi, yes. But not their king, not their savior and messiah. 
And the other reason that the religious leaders were upset at this moment is they were worried that now Jesus declaring himself as king in this way would cause an uprising. The people would gather around Jesus and the Romans would come and suppress this rebellion and uprising. So as we see, when Jesus made this triumphal entry into Jerusalem, there was no going back for him when it came to doing the Father's will, dying for our sins and establishing the Father's eternal kingdom because he was doing it at the busiest of times. He did it in a way to fulfill another of the Old Testament prophecies and he did it under the supervision and under the notice of the religious leaders. Now, some people might wonder, was Jesus fully aware of this when he made his triumphal entry, that there was no going back, what he was really facing as he was going towards Jerusalem? Of course he knew. Do you remember about the halfway mark in Jesus' three-year ministry? That was the first time that Jesus shared with the disciples that the Son of Man must suffer and die, but three days later rise back to life. Well, here's an interesting thing. We just read from Luke 19. If you flip back in your Bibles to Luke 18, you'll see a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples just before they arrived in Jerusalem. And as we're about to see, Jesus was very aware what was about to happen. He said, listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where all the predictions of the prophets concerning the Son of Man will come true. He'll be handed over to the Romans and will be mocked, treated shamefully, and spit upon. They will flog him with a whip and kill him. But on the third day, he will rise again. As we see, this is what Jesus said to the disciples just days before he made his triumphal entry in. And you notice the accuracy of the words that Jesus spoke, that he would be handed over to the Romans, that he'd be spit upon, that he'd be mocked, that he'd be whipped and flogged and then die. And as you read the stories as we're about to this coming week with Good Friday, you'll see the accuracy. Jesus didn't just say, this could happen, it might happen, or perhaps. He stated very clearly what would happen. So as we see, as Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he knew there was no going back when it came to facing the cross and fulfilling the Father's will. Now, some may also wonder, but didn't the religious leaders give him an out? Didn't they maybe give him a possible out? And they did. Because remember, when the religious leaders saw everything that was happening, they turned to Jesus and said, Rabbi, will you tell your followers to be quiet, to be silent? That could have been an out for Jesus, couldn't it? If he, didn't want, if he wanted to go back, he could have easily said, you're right. I'm having second thoughts right now. I'm going to silence them. Forget this ever happened. I'm just going to leave, just like I departed. But no, realizing that there was no way going back. This is what Jesus replied to the religious leaders. If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. So as you see, Jesus was fully aware at this moment as he made his triumphal entry that there was no going back when it came to fulfilling the Father's will at that moment to die on the cross for our sins so that the eternal kingdom could be established. That because of our belief in Jesus, we too, because we're forgiven, will experience eternal life. But some will look at this and say, okay, Dean, I get it to this point. But what about the Garden of Gethsemane? Didn't he want out at that moment? Didn't he try to get out of it? But we need to look at that closely. Yes, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed three times for the cup of suffering to be taken away. But you notice what he didn't pray for? To go against the Father's will. Each time in that plea, he said, not my will, but your will be done. 
Do you see what Jesus was not willing to go back on from the moment he was entering into Jerusalem? Doing the Father's will. Yes. He asked if there was any other way than through the death on the cross for the Father's will to be done. But from the moment he entered into Jerusalem, he realized this is what I'm not going to go back on. And that is doing the Father's will. As we see in this story, and as we've been looking at over the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at crossroad moments, haven't we? We began with looking at Jesus on trial by Pilate and looking at that crossroads, what is truth? And then last week, we looked at Jesus washing the disciples' feet in the upper room. And we discovered that both Judas and Peter were at crossroad moments and some of the factors that affected them making poor decisions at that crossroads. So today, we look at a crossroad moment that Jesus experienced entering into Jerusalem and realizing at that moment he was not going back when it came to doing the Father's will. And that is something that Jesus teaches about that should be a firm commitment on every believer's part. Not going back, not turning back when it comes to the Father's will. Because something that Jesus always made clear to would-be followers is this. If you're going to follow me, I want total commitment. Don't look back. Don't go back to say goodbye to the parents. Don't look back as your hands are to the plow and so on and so on. He wanted total commitment. No going back when it came to following him. And one thing we should not go back on is following the Father's will. And on that Palm Sunday, that was something the crowd was very good at. The people in our story were very good at, except the religious leaders. Being dutiful. Being intentional of not going back on doing the Father's will. And what do I mean by that? Well, look how the story began. With Jesus asking two of his disciples to go into the village ahead and untie that colt. Now, there were still some uncertainties for them, some unknowns for them. Yes, they were to tell the owner of that colt, the Lord needs it. But, what if he said no? What if he hesitated? What if he was unsure that it was Jesus' disciples who were there? They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to expect. But what did they do anyways? They went and did the Father's will, even though they didn't have full understanding of what to expect or what would happen. And then, let's look at the owner of the colt. Now, many scholars think that Jesus probably had met this man before, and had said to him, there's going to be a moment of time when I'm going to send some of my disciples and tell you that I need your colt. An agreement was made. Now, the moment came, and this owner of the colt could have taken a step back, could have changed his mind at that moment and said, no, I've changed my mind. I'm going to take a step back and not do the Father's will. But that's not what he did. He went forward with doing the Father's will. Look at the crowd. What was the Father's will that day as we saw in the prophecy from Zechariah 9.9? <coughs> the Father's will was for the people to worship Jesus, to praise Jesus along the road. And that's what the crowd was doing. They were doing the Father's will at that moment. And look at the disciples. They too were doing the Father's will by following Jesus faithfully and obediently at that moment. As we see on Palm Sunday, when people were at that crossroad moments, they were committed to doing the Father's will. But here's the challenge. That's just one day. Every day, we must do the Father's will. And the challenge for us is this. Some days we're committed to doing the Father's will, and some days we take steps back. And didn't we see that? in the events that followed Palm Sunday? Look at the crowd. The same crowd on Palm Sunday who is praising Jesus, cheering Jesus, supporting Jesus, is now 
shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Were they doing the Father's will at that moment? Look at what we looked at last week, Peter and Judas. How they changed, how they made poor decisions that night that Jesus was betrayed. They weren't doing the Father's will. The Father's will was with those warnings that given to resist the temptation to deny, to pay attention not to betray the Lord. But they took steps back, didn't they, when it came to doing the Father's will. And the same with the disciples. On Palm Sunday, they kept Jesus the center of their focus. They followed Jesus. But what did they do when Jesus was arrested? They abandoned him not doing the Father's will. And that is a tendency, isn't it, on believers' part. When we come to various crossroads in life, sometimes we're very good at doing the Father's will, and at other times we take steps back. As Jesus shows us, the life of a disciple, the life of a follower of his, is to follow in his example that whenever we come to a crossroad in life and have to decide, are we going to do the Father's will or not? Our choice should always be the same as his, to do the Father's will no matter what. So what about you? We saw some of the followers. We saw some of the crowd. We saw the disciples. That sometimes they take steps back from doing the Father's will. Is that your tendency? Do you sometimes do this in your walk, in daily decisions with the Lord? Let me give you some, for instances, some examples that kind of tie into the story of Palm Sunday. When Jesus asked you to do something, to maybe go ahead and do something, even though you might not have full understanding, even though you may not know how it's all going to play out, do you say yes to his will and do it anyway like those two followers did that went into the village to get the colt? Or how about when Jesus asks you to do what he asked of the owner of the colt to give to him? That's going to require a sacrifice. That colt was worth a lot of money. That was a big sacrifice in giving. But he did it out of the will of his Lord. When Jesus asks you to make a sacrifice, whether it's with the giving of your money, or maybe your time, or your talents, are you always willing to say yes to the Father's will when it comes to that kind of giving? How about with worship? We know it's the Father's will for us to worship Him. But what about you? When it comes to worshiping Jesus, is it always your will to do it? Do you always follow His will and make that time to worship? Or does it depend on what is your will that day? Today I want to will myself to sleep longer or to take a Sunday off or to maybe do this as my priority today instead of worship. Do you always do the Father's will when it comes to offering Him the worship He deserves? And how about following? As we see, when the disciples were faced with fear, with disappointment, with other struggles, that night that Jesus was betrayed, it caused them not to do the Father's will. They stopped following him faithfully and obediently. When you have disappointments, when you have doubts, when you have fears, does that stop you from following the Father's will? and staying close to Jesus and obeying Him? There are so many times, so many crossroads each and every day that we're confronted with this. Am I going to do the Father's will or not? And as Jesus shows us, there should be no stepping back. There should be no going back when it comes to doing the Father's will. And if that has been our struggle, if that has been the case, then maybe, we need to look at the story of Palm Sunday closer and to realize what Jesus did for us. He could have turned around and went back from doing the Father's will, but he saw us and he realized, I don't want my child 
to miss out on forgiveness and eternal life. So what did he do at that crossroad? He said yes to doing the Father's will. And with that in mind, when we ever come to a crossroad and have to decide, am I going to do the Father's will at this crossroad? May we remember Jesus. Remember what he did for us and say, because he did it for me, I'm going to do it for him. I am going to do the Father's will, no matter what sacrifice it is. That is a lesson from Palm Sunday. That is a blessing from Palm Sunday. And if we truly want to be blessed by this message, then let's take it to heart. So the next time we come to a crossroad to have to decide, are we going to do the Father's will? Our decision will be the same as Jesus. God bless and amen. Well, we continue our service on this Palm Sunday with more special music by Don Pritchard. Before we sing our communion hymn and enjoy the sacrament of Holy Communion, let us come before God, shall we, in our prayers of the people today. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we are so blessed on this Palm Sunday because as we've been journeying through this series on facing various crossroads in life, you've reminded us of a very important one. Whenever we come to that crossroads of doing your will, Jesus showed us it's not always easy. That some of the crossroads of doing your will requires sacrifice, requires effort, requires giving up certain things. But as he also shows us, doing your will is the most blessed thing. So help us, God, as we come to crossroads just like Jesus did and are confronted with doing your will, that we always say yes to it just like Jesus did, because that is the way we build the kingdom for you. Not for our glory, but your glory. So God, help us to be doers and builders of your kingdom by doing your will when we are faced at those crossroads. We know, God, a blessing that we need to pray for right now is Holy Week. Because this is a week that we can be reminded once again of the incredible love that you have for us, dying on the cross for our sins. We can't imagine what Jesus went through, but he went through it for each and every one of us. And may we never take for granted the gift of his love for us. We pray this day, God, for the people of Ukraine. We know the devastation, the destruction, the pain and suffering and anguish they are going through at this time. And we just lift them up to you, God, and just ask for your hand of hope and strength to be upon them. And we pray for peace. How that is going to happen, I don't know. But you're a God who is in complete control. You're a God that nothing is impossible for. So we just lift this situation up to you, God, and just pray for your peace, your sustaining on the people who are suffering there. We pray for the sick, God. We know many are going through illness right now, whether it's with COVID, whether it's with cancer, whether it's with other health issues. And we just pray for your hand upon them to give them the healing they need at this time. We pray for the grieving. People who are lost loved ones, people who are maybe grieving changes with their health, lost relationships, family that have moved away, and so on and so on. It's not easy dealing with grief. And you experience the grief of the death of your son on Good Friday. You know that feeling. So comfort the grieving at this time, God. We pray for our children. We know that our children very much have been affected by this pandemic. So we pray for our children. We pray for teachers, for them to be kept safe through this pandemic, through this next variant that we are facing. Help them, God, to have some normality, some type of peace and sustainability in their life. We pray as well for our government leaders. It's not easy what they've had to go through. And we pray, God, that they realize they can't do it alone, that they need your help. So we pray that they lean on you. And we continue our prayers for our frontline workers. We know the challenges they have had, how depleted they must be, how stressed they must be. Help them, God, to know that the strength can be found in you, that you can keep them going and keep nurturing them. God, we thank you that in just a few short moments we can celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. May it be a time of blessing, may it be a time of memory, may it be a time of celebration that draws us closer and closer to you. We offer this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. But well, let us join now in singing our communion hymn, Here, O My Lord.
This is the Lord's table. And the Lord invites us to share in this joyful feast. From east and west, from north and south, we're invited to take our place at the banquet in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Holy God, creator of heaven and earth, it's with joy we give you thanks and praise this day. We praise you, most holy God, for sending your only Son, Jesus, to live among us, who was full of grace and truth. Sharing our joy as well as our sorrow, he healed the sick and was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and died that night that we might live. We praise you that he overcame death and is risen to rule the world. He is still the friend of sinners, and we trust him to overcome every power by the church and believe that when he comes in glory, that we will celebrate victory with him. Therefore, in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we take this bread and we take this cup and we give you praise and thanksgiving as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, we ask that you pour your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and wine that we and all who celebrate this feast will be one with Christ and he with us. We offer this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. According to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, we do this. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. And after he gave thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me, the body of Christ. Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me, the blood of Christ.
Well, I pray that you've enjoyed today's service. It is such a blessing that you are part of our ministry here at Mount Pleasant Online. We just thank you for supporting us in the ways you do. And as I've always said, this is one of the easiest ways you could ever witness. If you know somebody who could be touched and blessed by being fed by God's word, to share our services with them so that they can be touched just like you. As I shared earlier that we have our Good Friday service as well as Easter Sunday. So if you're joining us online, look for our services when it is convenient for you to join in. I pray that those services will just be as uplifting as today's was for you. After the benediction, we'll sing our benediction piece followed by O Canada, our ongoing tribute to our frontline workers. And now the benediction. May the Christ who walked on wounded feet walk with each one of you. May the Christ who served with wounded hands reach your hands out to serve. May the Christ who loved with a wounded heart fill your hearts with love. And as we leave this time of worship, may you know that everyone you see, see the face of Christ in you, and everyone you see, you will see the face of Christ in them. God bless and amen, and we'll see you on Good Friday.